Well, some of you know um, this guy here on the, on the left. Um, last year, he gave us a pre-presentation of a, of a building that uh, he was just about to complete in Bilbao, uh, Spain. You've seen it on the covers of things and big articles and articles comparing it to, to the Getty down south. Uh, I like shark better. Shark, the comparison to shark. Better, better than comparison to shark, yeah, yeah. He has gotten a little full of himself this <laughs> last year. He has gotten one prize and one award too many. However, we'll take care of that in the next 20 minutes. <clears throat> uh, I could have orchestrated this, but I'm going to just do it and ask you to do something. Frank is a very old friend of mine, and since we're sort of close in age, although he's older, it's very difficult um, to be, you know, have ad adulation of somebody you're friendly with. But this fucking building is an amazing building. <laughs> Can we all stand and give that building a... Stop it! Stand up. Those of you who have not seen it, go see it. <clears throat> its relationship to the town is amazing. I don't know how we thought it up, the way it knits with this strange little industrial town on the water. You've read about it. But it's really one of the great buildings of this century. I mean, you don't really uh, get to know people who do those things. And, uh, and even though he is full of himself, he still kicks dirt usually every day a little bit. And uh, I love him for just stopping in. He's just in between things. He drove down from San Francisco this morning. Right after this, he has to fly down for something in LA. And it's lovely and a pleasure for him to join us with Paul Goldberger, who is the you know, the name brand describer of our environment and buildings. And one other thing we're going to do here, we have this overly elaborate, beautiful, fancy, amazing box here. This box has Bill Bowell on one side, Frank Gehry on another, Guggenheim Museum there, and what's on this side? Frank's name is twice on it. <laughs> and the only thing that saves it is it's spelled wrong once. It's not. <laughs> uh, and on the top, Engraved in this, I guess it's aluminium, uh, is a section drawing um, of the Bilbao and what purports to be Frank's first sketch. He did it much later, but <laughs> purports to be his, the first sketch. And then inside of it, beautifully, ugh, all wrapped up is, I think all, I don't know, I haven't unwrapped it, so, but I think it's all his, ow, there's all bottles, his books. There's, there's bottles about, of wine in there. <laughs> all the books about uh, Bill Bow and about <coughs> Frank. But also what goes with this when we draw it out of the hat, I think it's a really interesting gift, is two uh, round trip business class tickets to Bill Bow. <laughs> hotel rooms and entrance to the museum. Which hotel? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I have a small advise, a group of advisors to the board, and uh, this was thought up, I think it's extremely amazing, uh, by um, Courtney Ross. Uh, there's Courtney right there. And um, she didn't want me to mention her name, and then I argued her into it. I didn't have to argue that hard. Uh, it's an amazing gift, and I would like Frank to pull a number out of the hat, and that will be our first drawing. Mix them up and pull a number out, and that's who wins. That's the only reason I can. And if you're in the simulcast room, if you're in the simulcast room, rush in, but you have to be here. Jay Chiat, I hope you win. <laughs> 72. 72. Oh. Whoa, come on down. Is there somebody I like? <laughs> Ted Virgin, or have you been here before? He's not answering. 
Ted Virgin? Jack no. <laughs> Now, we all know he's not worthy of this gift. Are you a Ted Virgin or have you been here before? You're a Ted Virgin. Oh. We should throw him back in and get somebody else. <laughs> okay. Would some volunteer take his name and everything? There's a whole certificate and that whole thing. He gets to shake uh, your hand. Go ahead. There you go. Oh. <laughs> go for it, guys. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is true. This is also this is about the weight of the museum too. Yeah, I think actually. Um, we want to talk a little bit about architecture and a little bit about the digital world and a little bit about where they do or do not intersect. And um, I want to start out by throwing out three fallacies of this world right now, um, and it will keep Frank in line by not talking about Bill Bilbao again for at least five minutes. Um, the first is that design makes things better. The second is that technology brings us closer together. And the third fallacy, the third mistaken belief of this time, is that in an age of cyberspace, virtual reality and reality are essentially the same thing. Um, we're in a very amazing moment in terms of design right now. We, this is a more visually literate society than it has ever been. People care more about architecture. They pay more attention to design than, than has ever been. And the level of design in the environment has risen. Uh, in a way, what we're watching is the dream of the Bauhaus from the 1920s finally realized design is accessible to the masses at very good prices. Uh, you go to the Gap. You go to Pottery Barn. You go to Crate and Barrel. And you see there before you this mass world of quality design. The shit that used to be in, in the mass market is no longer there in quite the same way. Um, what that's proven, though, among other things, is that the quality of life has not necessarily risen to match it as we were promised it would back in the 20s. Uh, I mean, those of us who spend our lives believing in architecture and design, I think we're taught to believe it has a kind of power that, in fact, it doesn't really have. I mean, now that the world is finally completely free of fake wood formica kitchen cabinets and avocado refrigerators, we have not seen peace, prosperity, and the good life descend upon all of us, as in fact I think we were <coughs> le led to believe it would. Um, so that's one fallacy. And in a minute I want to try to talk about what that, what that means for architecture, design, and technology. Well, one thing I'd okay. like to say is that, that um, in trying to design furniture for furniture companies that make this stuff, when you try to do something that's sort of undesigned or non-toxic right. non with design, like some of the stuff, uh, when I go out and get furniture for my clients, I won't buy my own stuff, I won't buy anybody, I'm always looking for some dumb thing that doesn't look designed. Right. And every furniture company I try to propose to do that with says, no, no, you, you need a signature. Right. So it's a marketing thing in, in the end that drives it somehow. But, well, but there, there is this sense of the architect as celebrity, right? That, that is sort of, that... No, but that wasn't we, enough. I right. could sign the thing. They wanted mm -hmm. a, a trick, um, you know, something that was recognizable that would be a, a, a recognizable thing that, for patenting, I guess. Is that what it is? They want to patent it? But maybe that's good in a way, in that one of the things <laughs> that I, that, that's been on my mind that I've sort of been trying to get to in, in this little list of three weird fallacies is this notion that, w that authenticity has been devalued in a certain way today. Because there's so much uh, virtual this and virtual that. And we've come almost to question the reality, the, va the value and the validity of real things in real places. Because virtual places have so much power in our lives right now. So that if they want something from you that's different from somebody else's, doesn't that sort of help get us in that direction? I don't know. <laughs> I'm scared about the virtual thing. What, what are we going to be left doing, guys like me? We'll be designing on computers and 
Well, you design on computers now, but, but the question is designing for a world of computers as opposed to using the computer to design something that has concrete reality. Yeah. Those are very different things. I mean, you've said that you could not have created Bilbao without a computer. Right. You couldn't do Disney Hall without a computer. Yeah, but I don't, um, I don't know how to turn the thing on. <laughs> well, you know how to hire people who do, so yeah. that's, that's right, all right. right, right. Um, but, um, Good point. That's all that matters. Let me, let me talk a little bit about this idea of technology and community, because all of these things do connect, and the notion of authenticity and real places and the notion of community, I think, are very close together and very, very important. I mean, I've been very struck by the way in which, as we are more and more wired and more and more connected, and there is more and more technology, and as Nicholas Negroponte would have said, the, the phone quotient or whatever that term was gets higher and higher, now, but, but on a personal level, we're more and more fragmented. fragmented we are yeah. more and more fragmented, compartmentalized mm -hmm. society with less and less of a sense of common ground. But my cultural uh, cl uh, clients, right. who do cultural projects, say are excited about it because they say that the, that these buildings for culture are going to be the meeting place, and people want to are looking after their. Well, I think that's actually stuff. happening. In yeah. fact, I think that is that that's one of the reasons. That's what happened that, at the Getty. <laughs> it happened at the Getty, absolutely, and it's yeah. happening at Bilbao. I mean, yeah. the Getty is, is, is paradoxical and fascinating because the Getty, I think, was intended to be a piece of very high architecture and, in fact, was roundly criticized before it was built for being too elitist and up on this hill overlooking the 405 freeway and removed from the people and disconnected from the city. And in fact, it turns out to have been this populist, overwhelming populist success and everybody's, all the people who were presumably being cut off from culture by the elitist Getty are, have booked up reservations so you can't get a parking space till August now. <laughs> they're so, and they're crowding the bus lines and they're coming in by rollerblade and bicycle and every other way. Yeah. Um, that's, that's an extraordinary phenomenon, but I think it's, and it's very meaningful in terms of the desire within this culture to actually find a real place to go to. I mean, the, the paradox in Los Angeles, of course, is extraordinary that you get in your car and you drive around and then you park your car so that you can walk around and have an urban experience. Um, but after all, that's what Disneyland has been for 45 years, nearly 50 years now, is yeah. driving down the freeway, parking your car, and then pr playing city. But and you know, when I, when I was hired to do that thing in Europe for Disney, I was really holier than thou about right. theming, and I said, right. not for me, I'm not going to do this theme stuff. And then after the building was built, it was a Frank Gehry theme. It, I got right. caught. And I wouldn't do the interiors, because I thought, I'm not going to get involved with Mickey Mouse like that. I don't know how to do it. But I should have mm -hmm. done mm -hmm. it. And now I'm being asked to do a, a casino, and there's a lot of anxiety about w whether an architect should do it. But it's the same, it's a meeting place. They're just going to play with slot machines too, but. To what extent, <laughs> hey, hey. Slot, slot machines, Picassos, I mean, it's all the same, right? It's you know, years ago, of, some yeah. guy came from Bopapaswana to my office, and yeah. a little guy who's a theme park guy in, in Africa, and he wanted me to design a theme park for him, and he described in about 15 minutes every part of Disneyland, mm -hmm. but he, I don't think he realized he was doing it. He thought this was a new great thing. And at the end, and he said, you know what's great about my thing? Slot machines. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. Uh, let's get back, uh, <clears throat> let's get back I, to Bill Brown. When I was a kid, my <laughs> father had slot machines. I should announce it. Slot machines in your house? Yeah. Okay. That's that, what he did for a living. He put out slot is machines. Is that how you pay, that, that how you got, got your allowance? Right, right. In other words, if you, if you hit it right that week, you got your allowance, <laughs> right. and if you didn't, your father got the money? Right. Okay. <laughs> anyway, let's get back to Bill Bow for a second, um, where at least, so far as I know, they're not yet slot machines. Um, it's kind of the, like a slot machine, though. 380,000 people have been there. Right. And they said that the publicity if they had to pay for it, it was worth 50 million. So that's half the cost of the building. Uh, certainly, yeah, the if, I, yes, if I think right. of the kind of fees we got paid for writing about it, sure. I mean, yeah. it's easy to see how you could reach that kind of total. <laughs> 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 um, never, 
what about the role that has played in both that individual community of Bilbao, in Spain at large, and in creating a kind of world community around a single iconic building? Can we talk about that a little bit? Well, first of all, the, the reason for making it, there were two reasons for making an iconic building. One was that the city wanted to be put on the map. They set it like the Sydney Opera House. The second is something that for years I've been discussing with artist friends is that they want to be in a building that's important. And, and they don't want to be in a neutral box. They want a, a confrontation. And, and we've had that response from the artists. So there's two reasons right. to make it that. And, and 20 years from now, if everybody doesn't know the architect or anything and comes to Bilbao, they'll, and they're told that's the art museum, the message is this town loves art. Yes. The town was doing this for commercial reasons. They, wanted, they were deaccessioning their in industry and their people, their economic advisors told them that they should do a new train station, a new airport, a new art museum, a new concert hall, and a blah, blah, blah. So they've, they had Sterling and Calatrava right, and right, Foster. Right. And, and, they've done, and they've done all that stuff. They've done it all. Yeah. And uh, they've made it user friendly and they're getting the hotels together. And uh, so it's turned uh, this whole place around and given it an identity which they wanted. Now, where the Basques are a specific kind of character. They're very uh, insular. They're right. separate from Madrid. Uh, they are very proud. And this is their museum. It's not Tom Cran's museum, like everybody thinks. The, it's, he is the head of the Guggenheim yeah, Museum in New York. It, who, everybody, I mean, there's a lot of talk about right. American colonization. It's cultural imperialism. Yeah, it's not like it's the right. reverse. It's mm -hmm. absolutely reverse. Well, it was their money, right? It's their money, so. but they're running it. Mm -hmm. in their way. Now he runs the, the programs and as long as he does, and they're very critical of everything he does, as long as he runs programs they like, okay, mm -hmm. the, minute, the minute he's, so they're very much in control and it's very much a Basque cultural thing and it's an identity thing and how long it can last, how long before the, the blush is over and people stop going, you know, and I don't know. It's not. They're still going to shark, Frank, right? Yeah, I mean, but, it, 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 so, I mean, but like the Sydney Opera House is in, where, in, in Sydney. In Sydney, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. An extremely clever move of them to put it there, actually. <laughs> so there it is. And to the people go to Sydney, but I don't know about Bilbao. You know, I, it struck me about the Bilbao building. One, you, People have talked about it as the first great building of the 21st century and a lot of stuff like that, which I must say to me is sort of a piece of crap as a view of it. Yeah. Um, and I say that not to diminish the building because as you know, no, I'm no. a great admirer of it, but I think in many ways it actually is the last great traditional building in that it is really about not virtual space, but real space. Yeah. It is about construction, it is about materiality. You feel the titanium, the stone, the concrete, the metal, the glass, all those things. It's about the reality of real space and real form and the symbolic and cultural power that those things, when brilliantly put together, can have, which has no other equal in life experience, I think. And that brings us back to the whole question of virtual space, virtual experience, and digital replications of things. That yeah, that's the 21st century, you're right. That's the 21st yeah. century, and I think in a way what the building of Bilbao does is take all of the impulses that have motivated and moved us in the making of architecture and space in the 20th, 20th century, pull them all together, brilliantly synthesize them, make of them something new, but of something that is also profoundly committed to the idea of real form, real space, real experience, and not virtual anything. Right. Uh, Tom had a vision for the art of the 21st century, like every art museum director does. And, you know, he was seeing the Ponza collection, which is virtual. Some of it is right. in little notes, and then you make it. Right. And he was looking at the museum as a performance space, and, and that's why some of those catwalks are in the galleries, so mm -hmm. that you can use galleries for 
perform. But you can you, you can use any building as performance. Right. I mean, but, you know. But this gives them even the, God help us this one. I mean, yeah. anything. But this gave them the right. the theatrical mm -hmm. tricks so they can mm -hmm. do all that. Mm -hmm. uh, that was that's his vision, and he's about as far out as right they they come right now. Now, he is also exploring for the last five or six years. Has been exploring technology, and he's been working with Samsung and Deutsche, mm -hmm. whatever telecom and all those people to try and bring to this building that technology. The problem was that we have spaces in that atrium for 80 foot high liquid crystal screens, mm -hmm. but it cost $20 million and nobody would donate it. He tried to get Sony to donate it. Mr. Sony, we're still looking. Yeah, but uh, Worman <laughs> diverted it all to Ted, so that took care of that one. Actually. <laughs> But there, there are yearnings for what you're saying right. in the program. Now, mm -hmm. they weren't accomplished, accomplishable because it ain't ready. It, it doesn't happen yet. Now, mm -hmm. that's, that's what I think we're all looking for is the next kind of connection. I've, I've just been hired to do this thing at MIT with all those geniuses that are into that. And I'm, right. uh, one of the reasons I was excited about it is to sort of stretch myself into another uh, do you place. do you think when you stretch yourself into another place, <clears throat> it is going to have, uh, in some way, be less uh, dependent on real and concrete form? I think the amount of the formal gestures of Bilbao won't right. be in the won't new. Won't be in the new no, thing. No, I, I think it'll be replaced by. I mean, let me ask you: Could we create some other could, titillation? Could we create a fra in in the 21st century? Could there be the exper a Frank Gehry experience within, let's say, the architectural equivalent of a black box. If you had a black box and the ability to do anything at all with technology within that black box to create some virtual architectural experience, I would love to try. You would love to try to do yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, but I think I think that kind of stuff is going to replace the some of the sculptural right. That that's stuff. Right. But mm -hmm. only if it happens also on the outside, like Times right. Square. Right. You see it there, where it's starting to... to um, and we made a proposal for Times Square, which has a movable building that mm -hmm. had arms and became a robot and, and uh, was going to be a cuckoo clock for Time Warner. Well, which... Which never... Never happened. Right, 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 right. They right. never came back. I can't <laughs> imagine why. I can imagine. I can actually just see the Time Warner board sitting there saying, "We have been uh, we're evaluating the suitability of a cuckoo clock as our corporate symbol." Um, <laughs> no, but the head guys approved it. Right. But then when I did it, they didn't come back. <laughs> I think it, uh, they were having troubles with Turner and things at that time with money. But the the people I was meeting with said. We spend a hundred million on a film easy, and it bombs. So a right. hundred million on a for, building is so this what? is nothing. Right. And it came in at eighty million, so I was under budget. But. <laughs> All the more reason. I should be. Times Square is extraordinary, <coughs> though, in that there you have, over a traditional urban environment that had declined terribly, this new regenerating form that seems to merge both a lot of the things we're talking about: the emphasis on retail, the desire for public life, which is, is very profound right now and, mm -hmm. and a counterbalancing force to sort of digital and, and online and virtual communication. Uh, technology and signs and buildings and all that stuff all as an overlay over this very traditional environment. I mean, do you, do you see that as taking us anywhere particularly, <laughs> that combination? Probably. I, I work out, I pump iron with Oliver Stone. He's not here yet, but, and I was doing this and he was doing this and he, leaned over to me and he said, I'm going to do the fountainhead. What's going to be architecture? And I don't know where it came from. I leaned over to him and said, nature. Like, the, like in the graduate plastics, you know, that's... Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then he said, really? <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's going that way, though. And I don't know. I mean, I just feel like there's going to be a... You know, We've had a hard time trying to make buildings that, rec that recreate the 19th century with any kind of plausibility. 
And so it's really There's hard. There's a lot of them out there, but yeah, they have very little credibility. They have less and less credibility but, as time goes on. But so. nature allows you to live in the past and the present at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting mm -hmm. thing. And so I think in our search for some kind of anchor, something to mm -hmm. hang on to, mm -hmm. we might very well go back to the natural, you know. What about one final before we wrap up? Let, let's, let's try to close it on the, the whole question of community. I mean, I see, um, we've talked about fragmentation before, yet w and, and the paradox of our being ever more connected all the time, uh, more and more people wired, more and more people connected, more and, more, and yet a, a, an increasingly fragmented society. And I also see kind of a, a, this urban impulse pushing up, like, if I can continue your nature metaphor, weeds through the concrete. <laughs> people wanting somehow to be in public. I mean, there's a reason we're all in this room, and there's a reason well, that the people who are in the, I hate to say it, but in the simulcast room don't feel they're in the preferred place. Um, there is something about people physically being all in one place that energizes and creates connections and whole levels of experience that so far cannot be replicated by means of even the most extraordinary technology, however great the other benefits it may bring us are. But what's missing, I think, what, where we've missed the boat, I think, architecturally anyway, in building the, the 21st or 20th century city is the politics that we adore. A, a democracy has created the chaotic American city. Right. And it, we, we reject it. I think we got to grapple with it. Well, that's what Bob Venturi was saying 30 years ago. Was he? Too, yeah. Son yeah. of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, of course. I mean, re reality is messy. <laughs> and it's, it, right. Get Bob next time, will you? <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, you're not going to give us more time, right? Not we, now. Not now. Another he has time. to go anyway. And he's got to go. OK. Great. Frank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Hey, Frank. Hey, Frank. 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 A little hug? A little Here's hug. my cart. Okay. See you soon. You come back.